Welcome back everyone to another review by Fat Ninja Studios. I'm your host, Jackie Kay, and today we are trekking across the sands of Dune, an adaptation of Frank Herbert's sci-fi classic. Dune is mostly an amalgamation of Muslim and Islamic culture, as well as inspired by historical events and politics. There will be spoilers ahead, so I suggest you see the film before you watch this review. Before we get started, please hit that like button, share the video on social media, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to thump that bell icon to stay up to date with our latest releases. The film starts off with our main character. Paul Atreides have been woken up from a vision of a young woman in the desert. And then he joins his mother, Lady Jessica Atreides, for breakfast. Jessica belongs to the Benu Jesuit, and she is trying to teach Paul of their ways. One of which is the voice a power similar to Jedi mind control from Star Wars. Paul returns to his studies and learns about Arrakis, where most of the film takes place. The planet has sandstorms powerful enough to cut through metal and is inhabited by humongous sand worms, referred to as the Shy Luke. It is also populated by the Fremen, who are a representation of Arab nomadic people in real life. The primary objective of the Empire is to mine the spice from the sands of Arrakis. Spice is used not only as a powerful hallucinogenic narcotic, but as the source for fuel for their interstellar drives. Without spice, interstellar travel is not possible. The film then cuts to a ship landing, bringing the Herald of Change to House Atreides. It is declared by the Emperor that House Atreides will be taking control of Arrakis in order to restabilize the people and boost the spice mining operations. The previous owners for 80 years were the Harkonnen, a race of brutal warriors and an industrial-led economy. Their leader, Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, is not only addicted to spice, but has been stealing the profits from the spice trade. This caused the Fremen to revolt, and so the Emperor decided to step in, and this is the reason House Atreides was sent in. From there, we cut to Paul greeting Duncan Idaho, pilot and expert soldier in the Atreides army. He is being sent on a mission ahead of the arrival to establish goodwill with the Fremen people. Paul wants to join him, mostly because he wants to prove himself, because he's next in line for succession in House Atreides. Paul tells Duncan about a dream where he saw them all dying. However, Duncan tells him not to worry, that House Atreides will always prevail. Paul joins his father in the family cemetery, lovely, and they have a conversation about duty, as Paul desperately wants to go to Arrakis with Duncan. Leto, Paul's father and ruler of House Atreides, reminds him of his duty to the throne, and in a heartfelt moment, tells him that if he decides not to lead House Atreides, he'll still be proud of him as a son. We now cut to Paul and Gurney the general of the army for the House Atreides, engaging in a sparring match. We get a glimpse of their shield technology, which is far more impressive than what was seen in the original 1980s version of the film. We then cut to Getty Prime, the homeworld of the Harkonnen. Baron Harkonnen is approached by his nephew, Vlaso Raban, who is insist on having left Arrakis to House Atreides. The Baron reminds him, though, that not everything is as it seems, and the Emperor is a jealous man. Back to House Atreides, Paul is summoned by the leader of the Benin Jesuit, the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohaten. Before he enters the chamber, his mother and the family doctor tell him to be careful and also do as the Reverend Mother says, and not to succumb to fear. He enters the chamber, and she immediately uses the voice on him to pull him over and make him kneel before her. Here, she presents a challenge. Paul must place his right hand inside of a box that will generate pain throughout his body. And he must withstand the pain, or she will kill him instantly with a poisoned needle. The real reason she is doing this is to bring about his visions, which she can use her own abilities to be able to see for herself. After the meeting, the Reverend Mother scolds Jessica, not only for having a male child, but also for teaching him their ways. Jessica believes, as many others do, that he is the next Messiah. The Reverend Mother, however, isn't so convinced. 
Paul overhears this and asks his mother what the prophecy is all about. All she can do at this point is give him vague notions of it. House Atreides arrives at Arrakis, a beautifully shot desert planet, and they're greeted by the local workers' union with false fervor, a byproduct of the years of Harkonnen rule, where mandatory attendance was part of the gig. The crowd were shouting, Vizin al Kahif at Paul, signifying that some of them believe that he is the next messiah. This belief was spread by the Bene Gesuit missionaries. The helicopter-style aircrafts that they use have a really cool blade mechanism, resembling and even sounding like giant dragonflies, with the glass shields in the front of the pilot looking like the bug's eyes. House Atreides is given a quick tour of the compound before settling in. Jessica then interviews candidates for housekeeper, choosing Shadat Mapes, who presents her with a Chris knife, made from the tooth of one of the giant worms. We cut to Paul, learning more about the planet, when a tiny robotic insect burns through his wall and attacks him. This is a hunter killer, and it is piloted by a Harkonnen soldier that has entombed himself in the wall six weeks prior, waiting for Hars Treaty's arrival. Meanwhile, back on Getty Prime, the Reverend Mother meets with the Baron as they have been conspiring against the House Atreides. She supports his cause of Harkonnen rule over Arrakis, but pleads with the Baron to not harm Jessica or Paul as they are part of the Benu Jesuit order. The Baron agrees, but plans on leaving them in the desert to die on their own. Leto decides to check on the equipment that the Harkonnen left behind of the mining operations and to see how everything works. Duncan returns bringing good news that he established a temporary friendship with the Fremen and has brought one of their leaders, Stilgar, to meet Leto. Leto promises Stilgar that it won't be like the Harkonnen rule. They are here to work together and that his people will not be hunted by House Atreides. This is also where Paul meets Stilgar offering him to stay for dinner, which honors Stilgar even though he has to decline and return to his people. Paul and Leto meet the judge of the change, Dr. Liet Kynes, and they embark on a trip to the desert to see one of the mining vehicles in action. When they get there, however, a sandworm approaches and they must evacuate the machine. Due to some complications of the dropship, Leto decides to land and rescue the 21 workers themselves. During the rescue, Paul inhales a bit of the spice, which sets off his abilities again, giving him a vision of a bloody battle. Since inhaling spice, Paul's abilities have been amplified, and he's now able to see both past, present, and future almost simultaneously. He reveals to his mother that she is pregnant with a baby girl, which she herself barely knows. We cut to Seleucia Secundus, the Imperial Army planet, where the Emperor is providing forces to House Harkonnen. These soldiers are referred to as the Sadokar. Later that night, House Atreides is betrayed by Dr. Yu, as the Harkonnen have his wife and are holding her hostage. He kills Jessica's housekeeper and manages to paralyze Leto. He then tells Leto that he will replace one of his teeth with a capsule, and that at the right moment, if he bites down, it will release a cloud of gas that will instantly kill anybody, including the Baron. Immediately after these events, the compound is under attack from the combined forces of the Harkonnen and the Sadokar. Epic explosions and many deaths later, Paul and his mother are captured by Harkonnen forces as they take them out to the desert. Duncan Idaho is also able to escape before the Harkonnens are completely overtaking the compound also fleeing to the desert for some semblance of safety or survival. We cut to Paul and Jessica and their captors. Paul uses the voice to free his mother, and she uses her abilities to kill the Harkonnen guards and take over the ship. Unfortunately, the unscheduled landing makes the Harkonnen disable the ship, forcing Paul and his mother to go on foot. Back at the compound, the Baron is indulging himself on various foods, while Leto has been stripped naked and is on display in a chair across the long table from the Baron. Dr. Yu is brought before the Baron, and he asks for his wife to be released, as he's done what the Baron said, and the Baron makes good on his promise to reunite them by killing them both on the spot. Of course. 
gloating over Leto, the Baron leans in. And this is when Leto breaks the capsule, exhaling his last breath and killing almost everyone in the room. If it weren't for the Baron's flight pack, levitating him up to the ceiling, he would have died as well from the gas. Back to Paul and Jessica inside their Fremen packs, they discover a note from Dr. Yu. He admits to his betrayal, but ensures that he took measures to make sure that Paul and Jessica would survive. Inside the pack is an Atreides homing beacon, geared to survive in the desert, and a thumper, a device used to attract the giant sandworms. The next day, Duncan meets with the Judge of the Change to try to get some help tracking the homing beacon and finding Paul and Jessica. While out in the desert, Paul continues to have more visions, with one of them showing him leading the Fremen people into battle. They are eventually found and brought to a siege, which is one of the underground cities that the Fremen inhabit. Here, they make a plan to contact the other Fremen tribes, and possibly get Paul off-world. However, their plans are interrupted when the shadow car arrives, with Duncan facing off against about a dozen of them in a hallway, giving Jessica and Paul a chance to escape down a different hallway. Dr. Lee travels down another hallway to help signal other tribes, but gets hit by a shadow car blade, and her last breaths are used to tap on the sand to call a Shai Halud, swallowing the doctor and her three aggressors. Using a sandstorm, Paul and Jessica evade their pursuers and crash land in worm country. Here they must trek through the desert using a compass that Duncan had given him, made by the Fremen people. Paul has a few more visions of battles, and finally they cross paths with Sildar and his people, one of whom being Chani, the girl from Paul's visions. Jessica is then challenged by Jemis, but because she is a Bene Jesuit and a woman, she is not allowed to fight. So Paul steps forward as her champion, knowing from his vision that he must kill this man in order to live. So, Paul gets the upper hand three times, trying to give Johnny the opportunity to yield. He is informed, however, that in this battle, one must kill the other in order to win. He delivers the fatal blow to Johnny. This earns him respect with the tribe, and they agree to take him to their siege. The movie ends on a lingering shot of the desert as the sun begins to rise on a new chapter. Overall, this film was one of the most beautiful films I've seen this year. The epic, sweeping shots of the desert were downright magnanimous. The special effects were top-notch, and the casting couldn't have gone any better. Props to everyone involved in this film! I did find a few bits here and there that were drawn out for sake of artistic vision, which did make the film feel a little bit longer than it actually was, but overall, I think they did a terrific job adapting the first half of the novel. I cannot wait to see part two. Hopefully it gets greenlit pretty soon. If you've been craving a big space opera style adventure, look no further. This blows the latest Star Wars trilogy out of the galaxy. I give the film an 8 out of 10. Damn near perfect. I know it will be released on HBO Max, but do yourself a favor and see this one on the big screen. for checking out our video. Please give it a like, share, and subscribe to our channel. You can reach out to us on Twitter, at StudiosPat, or chat with us on Discord, linked below in the description. If you're feeling generous, please check out our Patreon, also linked below. I've been your host, Jackie Kay, and before I go, sometimes our life can seem like an uphill battle, and there's no reason you should struggle needlessly. However, if the end goal is worth the effort, don't be afraid to face the challenge either. Humankind pushes itself to do better every day, whether that's in personal ways or industrial and technological advancements. Without these people breaking down barriers left and right, we wouldn't have all the things we do now. You can be a part of that. Don't give up on yourself. Thanks again, and take care.